Okay, let's talk about essentials of value. Essentials of value. These are fairly straightforward, I think. There's only four of them. And these are what, well, it's just as it says, essentials. You need all four in order to achieve a real estate value. The first one is utility. Utility. Your property has to have, to have some type of practical use. Some type of practical use. Uh, almost all properties have some type of practical use. Almost every one of them does. There are a few that don't. For instance, uh, they flood or there's no street access or because of the zoning, the town won't let you use it in any way, shape or form. I once had this listing, my, my friend, she lives down the street and I met her at Starbucks and she said, Lori, she said, Jack, I have this small property up in Marshfield. Can you help me sell it? So I looked into it and I went back to her and I says, Lori, this is so small. It's, it's not, it's like half a postage stamp. And she's like, I know. And the town won't let me do anything with it. So, um, I tried to get it. I tried to get the a butters to buy it. They weren't interested because it effectively had no use. It was valueless. And I, in the end, I recommended that she donate it back to the town, which is, by the way, I don't know if that will be on the exam, but it doesn't hurt to mention. That's called a dedication. And I'm pretty sure she eventually just gave it to the town and said, here, town, it's yours now. Cause she didn't want to pay taxes on it. That was just stupid for something that you can't do anything with. It was like, it was really small. It's about the size of two parking spots. That's about it. So, but most properties have some utility and you can use it in one shape or another. Uh, if that parking lot or parking spots were on Beacon Hill, well, then it would have been much more valuable where they spend a lot of money for parking spots on Beacon Hill, but not in this little situation in Marshfield. Number two, there has to be a sense of scarcity that what you're looking at is hard to come by think about that for a second that's a very interesting concept uh if you're on the beach and i try to sell you a grain of sand you're gonna be like dude why would i pay for a grain of sand when there's i'm standing on the beach with a billion grains of sand and therefore a grain of sand effectively has no value it's value less because you're on a beach with a billion grains of sand. They're basically free. But you take that exact same grain of sand and you travel to some far, far away galaxy. And uh, now it's a rarity, right? And now it has value. Same thing, just a different circumstance, a different marketplace. One where it was plentiful, basically unlimited. And the other one where it's scarce. And that drives up value. In 2020, you might remember we, we had a kind of national craze that I'm sure somewhere there's an economic student writing their PhD about this somewhere, if they, they haven't already. Uh, what did we kind of have a like this really weird thing that happened about perceived scarcity? We all of a sudden went out of our minds about toilet paper. Remember that? And you're right, it was crazy, but, um, but that's what happened. Did we currently, you know, back then we had about, uh, say like about 320 million people in the country. Did we automatically spike to 400 people, 400 million people and therefore need a lot more toilet paper all at once? No, we just kind of like lost our minds and we just went out and bought toilet paper. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy and we drove up the price of toilet paper, didn't we? It was harder to come by, so we bought more when we could. And it, we were out of our minds about it. That's perceived scarcity. Same thing happens in the housing market. You know who's really good with this is Tesla. Um, Tesla uh, also does that. Uh, they think you can buy it, but you really can't. We're going to mention Tesla in a, in a minute as well. Three is demand, which obviously goes directly with scarcity, which is, you know, basically a discussion about supply. Um, demand. There are two things you need to know about demand. There's the overall demand, and then there's effective demand. And the difference between these two things 
is like the top of the funnel to the narrow bottom part of the funnel because you're going to pre-qualify people. Let's actually use that Tesla example. How much is a Tesla? Like 50 grand or something. How many of you want a Tesla? Raise your hand. Admit it. A lot of you want a Tesla. They're nice, right? They're, they're all the rage right now and uh, they're very popular. But once you find out it's like 50 grand, then you're like, yeah, I don't know about that, right? And then you're like, maybe, maybe my used car is just fine. And that's the difference between overall demand and effective demand. Once you pre-qualify, you start off with like 100 people and then you end up with like two. Tesla is also, as I said, very good at this. As I said, my teenager wants a Tesla. He's part of the overall demand because let me tell you, he's not getting one. Not, now I'm not, maybe he get one on his own, but um, dad's not helping him buy a Tesla. Uh, and then you get effective demand. Uh, some of you might know that I'm in the process of buying a Ford Bronco, and Ford is actually trying to copy the same thing that Tesla did uh, with the uh, Ford Bronco. We'll see how that goes. I have not, as of the time I made this video, I've ordered it, but nobody knows when it's really coming. I won't know for a couple months when they actually might even make it. So who knows? You can ask me about it later. Um, last essential of value is the ability to transfer. Now, most of the time, this is not a problem. Most of the time, this is not a problem. And you don't have to worry about this. It can become a problem if during the uh, title insurance, which you'll talk more about um, in the different part of class, if the title insurance comes back with a problem on it where nobody will buy it because the seller cannot deliver clean and marketable title, that is going to be a problem. And until you rectify that problem, effectively you have no ability to transfer and therefore, effectively, the property has no value until you fix that problem. Uh, other things in this category would be for, and this would be kind of re uh, ridiculous, but, you know, it got seized by the IRS or the Drug Enforcement Agency, or maybe it got hold, held up in a probate court thing. That, that, that actually possibly could happen. The IRS thing's kind of silly, but, you know, you get the idea. You can't sell it for some legal reason. Uh, that would be the lack of ability to transfer. So remember, there, here's a good test question on the exam. Uh, Sally's property has an assessed value of uh, $400,000. But Sally's property is missing one of these, and you just fill in the blank, one of these essentials of value. Therefore, Sally's property is worth what? Well, a lot of people are going to say it's worth $400,000 because that's what the assessment is. That would be wrong. If it's missing one of these essentials, any one of these, one, two, three, or four essentials, then its value is zero. It's The value is zero, exactly. Until they fix the problem, uh, if you're missing one of these essentials, the value is zero. That is a classic test question on the exam. They tried to trick you on that one. You see how you can kind of you could kind of like 400,000 and then on to the next one. Now, got to read it all the way through. 